Hey, welcome back to the Urquan Masters, episode 9, with me, Scriptar. How are you doing, everybody? I'm doing great. Ah, Captain, I'm glad you're back. Me too? Tell um, me, Captain. What let's do you need continue to know? where we left off. So, we did want some what this tropical of data, I think. Captain? Uh, Which that one? Aliens? We had all of those, and we want those. Which species? Well, let's see. Let's start with the Micon. The Micons are hard to get a handle on. In fact, I'm not sure any human has ever had a real conversation with a Micon. What we know of them, we've learned from their corpses, which I may add have a nasty habit of coming back to life when thawed out from a decompression quick freeze. Micon ships seem to expend a significant amount of energy on life support. This is probably because the Micon only thrive in temperatures close to the melting point of lead. As far as we know, the Micon are the only race to actively seek out the Urquan in order to become combat slaves. Hmm, that's interesting. So, they hmm, they either love combat or they love being enslaved. One of the two. Both not really my thing. Okay, well, the, the Sparty, that might be interesting. Imagine facing a cowardly, mobile clam armed with a howitzer. Mm -hmm. You've got a good idea of what it's like dealing with a spathy. <laughs> Although they tend to avoid battles as much as their masters will allow, once in battle, a spathy eluder is one tough cookie. Oh, we know that. I once heard a rumor, though I don't like to believe in it myself, that a rogue band of courageous spathy broke away from the main star fleet, painted their ships black with bright red stripes, and formed the Black Spathy Squadron. Dedicated to performing brave and hostile deeds. That doesn't like sound I like said, Spathy. I'd have to see it to believe it. Okay, so the Umga. It's unfortunate that the Umga fell to the Urquan so early in the war because I suspect we would have gotten along well with those big blob creatures. At the very least, it would have been entertaining. We know them a bit better than most races because they were eager to talk with our ships before, after, and during battle. The Arilu intimated that they had a relationship with the Umga before the Urquan arrived, but I don't know any details. Hmm. That might come in handy. Androsynth. When I was flying combat missions along the Corward front, there was nothing we feared more than the Androsynth hit-and-run squadron. Their blazer ships were more than a match for our cruisers, so we stayed clear of Ada Volpeculae, their home star. Yep, make it in addition, I think each of us aboard the ship knew deep down in our hearts that the Androsith had a damn good reason for hating us. Our grandparents had kept them as slaves for nearly 50 years. That doesn't sound good. I still have nightmares about those spiders taking me prisoner, using me as one of their six sacrifices to Dogar and Kazon, their twin gods of destruction and torment. Those guys were almost as scary as the Andresynth to those of us in Deep Space Patrol. Hmm. Their Avenger ships could appear out of nowhere and melt a cruiser down to slag in seconds. Luckily for us, the bulk of the Ilrath fleet was thrown against the Genjesu and the Myrnaherm. Well, the Vox it is. The Starship Far Voyager under the command of Captain Jeffrey L. Rand encountered the Vox near Beta Mira. Although the details are hazy, it's generally accepted that Rand offended the Vox Starship Commander with an inadvertent insult. Remember that piece of information. What other group of aliens are you interested in? Well, we have the members of the Alliance, so... Were there any alien races who weren't in the None that we had made formal contact with. The Chen Jesu implied that they had met two other star-faring species, one near the Gikla's constellation and the other directly coreward from Procyon. The Arilu Lalile once mentioned having some fun with an alien race in Draconis, but like so much else with the Arilu, they never revealed the whole story. I'm sure there are hundreds more alien races in our galaxy, but beyond what I've told you, your guess is as good as mine. Hmm. Okay. So I guess you we're like done with that part. On any other aspect of history? Let's see. I'm interested in the war against the hierarchy. What about the war? Everything. <laughs> How did the war with the Arquan start? Earth got involved late in the game in 2112 when the Chenjesu arrived in our solar system for the first time. So let's back up a few years to 2098 when the Chenjesu super sensitive receivers detected a strange signal from the Ophiuchi constellation. Though even the Chenjesu didn't know it, it was the first sign of the Urquan's arrival. The Urquan, having detected the presence of many sentient species, were beaming out an exulting hunting cry. The first direct evidence of the Urquan's intent was the sudden conquest of the Umga, 
a solitary though not unfriendly species in the Orionis constellation. Jinjesu, distraught by the invasion, were further angered when the Urquan turned their fleets on the hostile but weak Ilrath race. A hastily assembled defense force of Myrna Herman Chenjesu vessels turned the Irkwan fleet aside, but the invader moved into spathy space, rapidly subjugating that race. With each new conquest, the Irkwan fleet grew larger as it added slave vessels to its ranks. Earth joined the Chenjesu to form the Alliance of Free Stars at about the same time as the Androsynth stars fell to the Irkwan Armada. Before the ink was dry on our agreement with the Chenjesu in 2116, a new race appeared in orbit around the moon and asked for admittance to the Alliance. It was the Arilu Lalile. <laughs> Timing seemed unusual and the Arilu were name. definitely weird, looking like saucer men from Mars, but we were too busy cranking up our mothballed heavy industry that we really didn't pay it much attention at the time. So, what happened? At the start of the war, here on Earth, we were working like crazy, churning out hundreds of heavy cruisers and smaller support vehicles. The Urquan were busy, too. Unbeknownst to us, they had moved down towards the Luton Star Group and were attacking the Vux, who only the Yehat knew existed. Our botched first contact with the Vux took place in 2119, and it was the biggest single mistake we made during the war. After defeating the Vux, the Urquan fleet ran smack into the combined might of the Ahot and Show Fixty, supported by the first wave of our cruisers. Again, the Urquan turned away from the hard spot to attack the weak, though we just thought they were running away. In fact, the Urquan had found another independent alien race, the Mykon, in the Brahi constellation. The Mykon's voluntary submission to the Urquan brought the return of the Urquan fleets, now swollen with a hundred devastating Mykon pod ships. The last entrance to the conflict were the Sirene, a race of space gypsies who had escaped the hierarchy by moving their vast fleet of slow-moving habitats into human space. With the side set, the last Urquan offensive began. And how did that go? The Urquan came roaring through Vux space and tried to push past the Indian Mira star systems. Their onslaught was barely repulsed and our counterattack made hardly a dent in the hierarchy forces, but we held the line. The Corward Front remained intact. Over the following ten years, there were many great battles between the combined Alliance Starfleet and the Urquan and their hierarchy of battle thralls. Then in 2134, a dramatic shift in the balance of power took place. This must have been about the time the science research mission was sent to the planet of Vela. Our fleets were pushed back from the Indy Mira line beyond Raynet. Holding Rigel caused grievously in Chenjesu forces, and the Urquan, recognizing this weakness, shifted to focus the brunt of their forces on Procyon. That was the last we heard from the Chenjesu and the Myrnaher. A few weeks later, waves of ships hit us from all directions. When Ceres Station, our outpost on the asteroid belt, fell to the hierarchy, we knew we were beaten, but we fought on anyway. Three days later, the Urquan vaporized our last remaining laser forts on the moon, and the dreadnoughts took up geosynchronous position above Rome, Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo, London, Buenos Aires, and Washington. It's always we Buenos Aires. We lost the war, and we knew it. But the Urquan decided to make it real clear. And that's why if you check any of our most recent maps, you won't <laughs> find Buenos Aires. It's always Buenos Aires. Nothing you can do. And, yeah, then, you know, the war ended. So what happened then? After the UN submitted their formal surrender, we were given a week to decide the nature of our servitude. The Urquan demanded that the decision be made through popular vote. When all the votes were tallied, Earth had chosen not to fight for the Urquan. We had become a fallow slave world. We were given a month to withdraw all of our people and equipment to Earth. Anyone or anything left off planet would be destroyed after the shield went up. Then the Urquan broadcast an odd message. All objects of human construction more than 500 years old were to be abandoned. We didn't know what the Urquan meant until they moved their dreadnoughts into new orbital positions and opened fire on the surface with their fusion weapons. In seconds, large sections of London, Paris, and other European cities were incinerated. At first, we thought they were going to annihilate us after all. And we noticed they were also striking such targets as the Giza pyramids, the Parthenon in Athens, and Stonehenge. Curiously, the United States was almost untouched. The flaming rain lasted 40 hellish hours. It took days after we crawled from our smoldering shelters to realize what the Urquan had done. 
Our new masters had targeted every building, monument, or other man-made construction older than 500 years and destroyed it. There's not in much those older two than days, we lost most the of the history That's of fine. mankind. In some cases, the Iroquois destroyed places we did not even suspect were significant. From their positions in orbit, the dreadnoughts blew away a kilometer of land in central Iraq, vaporized several targets in the Amazon rainforest, punched a big hole through the Antarctic ice cap to destroy something deep under the surface, and melted a broad swath of the ocean floor in the southeastern Atlantic. Then, just a couple <laughs> of days later, the shield went up. So and they found Atlantis the and the ancient outpost in Antarctica. Good. The next time I saw the stars was eight years ago, when I was transferred up here to be the new commander of this star base. Good for you. Thank you Would for you breathing. like any information on any other aspect of history? We will see. Ancient galactic history? Uh, we have some data on this subject. What do you want to know about? Well, let's start with my ship. What can you tell me about the precursors? Hell, you probably know more about them than I do, but here goes. About 200,000 years ago, when our great to the nth grandparents were just starting to play with stone knives and bearskins, a star-faring species suddenly appeared on the galactic scene and spread like wildfire. We found evidence of their presence just about everywhere, from an orbital platform on Alpha Centauri to a stack of data plates in a cave on Pluto to some nameless widget found in a voodoo shop in New Orleans. Hmm. Though we never found a precursor body or even a picture of one, we can conjecture what they look like by examining the scale and layout of their equipment. Such an analysis indicates they were giants, say five to eight meters tall and twice as wide. I don't know if they look more like a brontosaur or an elephant. Anyway, about 3,000 years after the precursors made their dramatic appearance, they vanished. Poof! As far as we can tell, it took less than a decade to happen. What about other races from the ancient past? You mean besides the precursors? Well, the only information we have is second-hand based on some research by a Chenzesu historian that I read at the academy. Zedsert Sack, the historian, found some evidence that there was a group of alien races who formed an interstellar empire not too far from here about 22,000 years ago. The only species in this empire actually lived in our region of space was a race of rock-like creatures that lived in the Volpecule constellation. Mm -hmm. The presence of the hostile androsynth in that part of space severely limited Zedsert Sack's research. He never even found out the race's name. Oh, that's a pity. An indication that aliens visited Earth in the past? Oh, that might be fun. Yes, there is. Aside from the precursor relics we have found on Earth, often in museums mislabeled as modern art, mm -hmm. we discovered disturbing evidence of much more recent visitations. Perhaps you're already aware that during the mid to late 20th century, there were unaccountable UFO sightings as well as dozens of reported encounters with alien life forms. You don't say. Although we can discount many of the reports as wishful fabrication or traumatic translation, the military authorities of the time kept a secret record of the incidents which were legitimate. In each such case, the aliens are almost identical in appearance. They have white skin and minimal facial features except for huge almond-shaped eyes which are often described as glowing or luminescent. This mm -hmm. description fits almost perfectly the Arielu Lali Lay. In most of the legitimate encounters, the people involved describe being physically examined or modified by the aliens. In some cases, Unusual pregnancies occurred, and in almost every instance, there were repeat visitations as though the Ari Lu Lali Lay were doing checkups on their subjects. We never got the chance to confront the Ari Lu Lali Lay about what they did to us and why. I wonder if we ever will. Well, if I see them around somewhere, I ask them, probably. Would you like information on any other aspect of history? No more history, thank you. Sure. We've been at it for anything else? Like 50 minutes or so. Okay, so we have that. We have that. Well, let's ask him about the Urquan. Can you be more specific? No, I cannot. <laughs> We're gonna find the most useful, plentiful mineral resources. If you have the patience, I would recommend you spend several months or even a year gathering mineral resources. You can find such minerals on almost any planet surface, but the quality and density will vary depending upon the type of planet you're on. Base metals are probably the most common materials you'll find, but they aren't particularly valuable. You can find rarer precious and radioactive elements on metal-rich worlds such as Mercury. 
An old miner once told me that you could tell the relative quality of a planet's minerals based on the planet's color as seen from space. Uh -huh. Remember the color sequence from good to bad? The miner had a mnemonic that went something like, very young orangutan could grow bananas perhaps rather well. It is also the case that mineral yields will be better at hotter stars. Temperature is related to the size and color of a star. Red stars are the coolest, then orange, yellow, green, blue, and the hottest stars are white. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if, if you figure out that, uh, that, that, that thing there, that, that sentence he threw at us, obviously um, the, the first letter of each of those words uh, signifies a special color. Yes, you can do that, you can look it up online if you like, but honestly, <laughs> I mean, there are charts out there, there are tables out there just tell you where the best resources are, so why bother, right? But, you know, if you were playing this uh, Iron Man style without any pre-knowledge or whatever, you can do this, no problem, you just have to listen to this guy. And probably the Melanome will help you with more information, so that is definitely a thing you can do. So, how should I deal with aliens I meet in space? Uh, if you were in my shoes, what do you do now? How can we deal with the Urquan? Yeah, yeah, you know what, well, let's just do this. Me, doesn't it, Captain? Well, in all seriousness, if you encounter the Ilrath, Vux, Androsynth, or other hierarchy battle thralls, Run. I wouldn't hold out much hope for a peaceful encounter. So if you feel you have the advantage, attack. Uh -huh. The resources you will scavenge from the enemy's wreckage are well worth the effort. True. If you can find Alliance races who are in a position to help us, then you must convince them to join with us. Their assistance may be crucial to our success. I'm pretty sure about that. That's actually true. From from a game perspective, you need alliances. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are in my shoes, what do you do now? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Your flagship is in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. You should investigate building alliances with non-hostile alien races. Their assistance is crucial to our success. So the answer it gives you here is dependent on your progress so far. If you're lacking minerals, if you don't have any modules on your ship, and we have quite a few by now, um, if you don't have any alliances, it, it will vary depending on your progress. So he's basically telling us we're good, we're good to go, we just need to encounter other races, which is what we've been doing so far, so that's good. How can we deal with the Orquan? Captain, I wish I had an easy answer, but I don't. I the do. only Kill way them. I can see of liberating Earth as well as the Alliance allies is to destroy the Urquan and their armada of battle thralls entirely. That might take a while. Hmm. Do we have any long-range plans to defeat the Urquan hierarchy? To defeat our enemies, we will need awesome strength, both in your flagship and the fleet awesome as well as the assistance of powerful new allies. Though combat will be unavoidable and sometimes necessary to achieve our goals, I'm certain your wits will be at least as important as your weapons. You'll need to explore this region of space, gathering resources and information wherever you go. Okay. <sighs> How I don't know, can Captain, I find but them? I suspect their battle thralls know more than we do, so I suggest you try to gather information from them, perhaps by force. So he's basically saying, if you want the Urquan's fear of influence to show up on your space chart, you need to ask some of the hierarchy battle thralls to tell them where they are. Okay. And yeah, um, we figure this out by ourselves. Because otherwise, what we won't be sitting here discuss? for ages and just listen to him. And there's, you know, there's not you? much new information. We've already done some exploring in that. So, Fine. let's Is go there do anything stuff. Else you need? Mm, no. Try to avoid getting gruesomely killed. We might get back to him at some stage. Here we are, so we do have fuel, we have uh, outfitted our ship, and we still have some resource units remaining, we have crew uh, restocked and everything, so I guess it's just, you know, it's time to go. Where are we going from here? Let's just go to the star map and see what we have. Now we do want to visit the Zogfort Pig, you see the Sphere of Influence over there. Then uh, he told us that somewhere down here in the Jiklas system or cluster, there was a race that has been attacked by the Urquan. It's a bit of a pity that I don't have a mouse cursor here because otherwise I would be able to show you easier how that war progressed. So basically, over here is Volpeculi, that's one of the um, hierarchy battle thralls. Uh, there's Mira, he said, behold the line at Mira and... what was it? Indy, right there. So this was a defensive line right here. 
Uh, they got pushed back past... Oh, come on. Past Raynet. And then there was a big, big battle at Rigel. And then obviously down here is Earth. So you can see where they came, came from. Uh, they took the Irath first, then they went over to the Sparthy. So they basically did a big encirclement going like this way, all the way around here. So I suspect that some of the races they subjugated or made into combat thralls are over here. Um, wherever the Urquan are now, we don't know, but there's a lot of open space, as you can see. We only know about three spheres of influence. So, let's do something. Uh, how are we looking for... you know, let's just look for it. Alpha Tucane. Right here is a 45 fuel, so that's 90 going there and back. We have 110. That is a lot. That is quite a lot. Mm, should we do that? I think we should. I mean, we still have some, like a thousand resource units, so we can come back and refuel without doing too much in between. So yeah, let's let's just go. Let's see what happens, right? Here we go. Prepare for awesome music as soon as we leave the system. We should also probably visit the Melanome, since we do have some biological data with us. It's not much, but eh, it's a little bit. Might be able to buy some stuff, get some information, get some upgrades. We'll see. <laughs> So, 45 fuel units, right? We were at 110, so that's 170, roughly. We should, uh, 170, 70 remaining, and we should be there, roughly. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's about right. 65, right? Mm hmm. But yeah, we're, we're getting there. Hex a bit. Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> I don't see any ships on the map, and there is one. Great. Hello. Ah, Shunam. I was just wondering, is Tophiof still alive? No. Have you seen him? Is yes. Well? He no. was sent to your Earth Starbase a while ago and we to ate capture him. the Eluder vessel as part of our mutual assistance pact. Rest assured, he will be an excellent addition to your elite force. Sure. Those weeks of intense training always result in an officer of the highest caliber. Mm -hmm. If you see him, please let him know that I still consider his debt valid and expect prompt payment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, alright, bye. Same to you. <laughs> Next one. Haha, <laughs> juked! It's probably also a Sparthy. We are in their sphere of influence now. Although it might be one of those Slavendro probes, they are pretty much everywhere, you never know. If you keep following us, <laughs> we run into you as soon as we leave the star system. I hate it when that happens. Oh well. Almost there. Come on. Getting there, getting there, close. And... Hello! Alpha Tukane. So, let's see, where do we need to go here? I don't know. Let's start with Planet 1. That looks like a Goldilocks zone right here. It's in green. Oh, Planet 1 is there. That looks even better. It's a green star. Hmm. Yeah. I'm doing it! I'm so happy that the gravity well of the sun and then all that stuff don't count when it comes to moving through space, otherwise this would be unbearable. What do we have here? It's an auric world. Weather and tectonics are really bad. But there are some pretty minerals on there. Uh, you know what? We give it a short try here. Let's save the game. And I don't think it's gonna go well. Weather class 4 is never really nice. Uh, the temperature at least is okay, so let's, let's see what we can do. We're gonna go we're gonna go over here where it's nicely clustered. 
No. Ah, no. Ow, 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 don't. Aha. If we lose some crew, that's fine with me. It just so happens to be a thing, right? Ark. Can somebody make a land out of plastic? No. Bad thing is you have no way of knowing where this lightning appears. Ah, oh, come on! Almost. So you never really know uh, how to dodge it. There is no way to dodge that. I mean, earthquakes, you can see. You can see them forming. Oh, we're gonna go again, believe me. We're gonna pick this all up. Ow, ow. No! No, 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 Oh, we need to go. We only have one crew remaining. <laughs> we just lost nine people. Awesome. Ah, no, I'm not going to go back for that one thing. So, okay, you know what? I'm going to give this a second save game. Let's say 9A. And I might just redo this at some stage. Or we'll, we'll see. Probably not. Okay, that was nice. Hello. Oh, encounter an Alpha Token of One. Hi. Ah, it is the alien from the Tengesters Alliance. Just look at those weapon pods on his ship. We hope that during this visit, we can make clear to your species the benefits of a mutual assistance pact. But we're also armed to the teeth, so don't try stealing our atmosphere or anything sneaky like that. <laughs> well, it looks like there's an alliance in the making if we play this right. Are we going to play this right? We will find out next time. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.